This evening, Books and Books is very happy to welcome Ms. Jacqueline Michard, presenting her new book, Two If By Sea. Ms. Michard has written 10 novels for adults, including several New York Times bestsellers. She's also written seven young adult novels, five children's books, a memoir, Motherless Child, and a collection of essays, The Rest of Us, Dispatches from the Mothership. Her first novel, The Deep End of the Ocean, was the inaugural selection of the Oprah Winfrey Book Club, later adapted for a feature film starring and produced by Michelle Pfeiffer. In this novel, she brings us the story of a man who has lost faith in everything, who rescues a child who can do the impossible. A suspense-filled novel on a grand scale, Two If By Sea is about the best and worst in people, and the possibility of heroism and even magic in ordinary life. Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Ms. Jacqueline Michard. You know, I, um, it's very thrilling to be here because this is the first place I ever signed a book. This is the first place that I came when The Deep End of the Ocean was published. And uh, it was one of the early times of what was the, of the beginning of the uh, Miami Book Fair Festival. And at that time, it was also one of the first performances of, um, of the Rock Bottom Remainders. <laughs> now, you know what that is, right? And uh, at that time, of course, I don't know how to play an instrument. So I was not one of the, I wasn't one of the uh, stars of the band. But Amy Tan and I uh, played the tambourine. And Ridley Scott played the guitar. And of course, Stephen King played the guitar. And what I remember best was that we performed a rendition that was absolutely horrifying of the song Werewolves of London <laughs> um, and, and had the best time ever. And there was a huge crowd. And, uh, and those were, were days when, um, when books were something that people gossiped about and had a good time, uh, uh, had a good time discussing and passing along. And I think that those days are not really over. I think they were over for a while. Oh, please, it's fine. I think those days were over for a while, but then they're starting to come back. And you know, it's gallant that that you know this bookstore remains that that Mitch has gone from strength to strength. And though he did not do what I really wanted him to do, which was marry me, I was a widow, and everybody had a crush on Mitch, you know? And he didn't marry me, but he has gone on to make this, uh, this one of the great book towns on earth. And, um, and all authors are grateful to him, and we all speak of him with the highest praise. So I'm not going to read from this book, you know, there's nothing more excruciating than listening to someone read from her book, even if you love the writer and even if you love the book. I teach in an MFA program. I teach at the Vermont College of Fine Arts. And when my beloved colleagues, who are some of the best writers I know, some of the best novel writers I know, get up with their books and they say, I'm just going to read from a few short sections of this, you think, what? kind of illness could I fake in order to get out of the room and keep the friendship intact? Because it's just, it's terrible to hear someone read to you if you're not a child, and then it's wonderful to hear someone read to you. Maybe I'll read a paragraph um, from the book, but normally I don't do that at all. But what I do like to do in situations like this, if you will indulge me, is to tell stories, little stories. And uh, and tonight, I want to tell you three little stories. One of them is, is scary. One of them is funny. And one of them is very sad. But they all have to do with the same thing. They all have to do with the place that stories occupy in our life. Stories are essential to everything about culture. 
They're the way that we teach our children to, to try to be good. If I had a t-shirt that I wore every day, it would say, be brave and try to do good. Because that's <clears throat> what most of us do every day is to do those things. And if you tell your children, I have a lot of children, I have nine children, and uh, if you tell your children, do these things because I say so, this is how the children hear you, as if you're doing this. That's how much they understand. But if you tell them a story, if you, tell, if you start with a story and say, well, this is what happened to a guy that I knew when I was growing up in Chicago. His name was Philip, but he always stood like this, so we called him 10 to 6. You know, um, and, and, and this is what he would do all the time, and, and this is how he got in trouble, and this is how he got, well, then they're hooked. If you tell someone a story, and certainly, you know, many of the leaders of great cultures, movements, religions, have all learned, I mean, what would the Bible, what would the New Testament be without stories? They're all stories that are the backdoor way of teaching people how to be brave and to try to be good. And so, um, but these stories, I, I don't know if these stories are illustrative of any particular moral. They just are a kick in the head. And um, they all happened to me within the last six weeks since I've gone out on this book tour to talk about this new novel, which is also about being brave and trying to be good, because that's what Frank Mercy has to do in this story. He's a guy who, he's a disabled police officer. He was a mounted police officer in Chicago, never, man, never expected to marry, never expected to have any life beyond his professional life. He had a very modest, contained life, and then he got hit by a car. He was disabled in a very undramatic way, not in a gun battle or anything like that. And he moved to Brisbane because he'd never been there. And he started to train stadium horses, stadium jumping horses, because that's what his father and grandfather had done. Even though he doesn't really like horses, he's good at taking care of them and, and teaching them. And uh, the Brisbane tsunami happened at that time. Now, you will notice that there really was no Brisbane tsunami, but it did almost happen. It almost happened maybe a little more than five years ago on Christmas Eve. And, uh, and the, all the forces were put together for that to actually overcome a big city uh, instead of... Uh, tragically, an island nation, as it did do in Indonesia. But all the forces were together. It didn't happen. But I imagined how it would be if it did. And as, uh, as a part of this, Frank loses his wife, um, who's an emergency room doctor, and her whole family. But because he is relatively brave and tries to be good, he goes out the next morning after his loss to... Um, to be a volunteer firefighter uh, as, on a rescue crew and rescues a little boy from the flood. And the little boy can do something that's not possible in real life. He can do something amazing, miraculous. He can by willing you to cause you to be your best self, whether you're a person, or whether you're an animal. What Ian does is say this is, this is the American Sign Language uh, one of the American Sign Language signs for behave or be good. And he does that. And people are helpless. If they have the ability to be good, they are helpless not to obey him. So you can imagine if a kid like that really existed, who would want to control him? If he could, for example, go into a bank and say, be good give me $10,000. Or if he could go into an art museum and say, be good, give me that Matisse. And so there are some, there are some people who are controlling Ian, 
and have great plans for his future. Uh, great, there are people of bad will who have big plans for him as when he's older than almost four years old, which he is. But there's a woman who takes him away from that and, uh, and they end up stuck in this storm. And that's when Frank rescues this little boy and does the only illegal thing he's ever done in his life, which is to fake a passport and to get a buddy of his to fake a passport and take Ian back with him to the Midwest in the United States. And he doesn't realize for quite a while that he's doing that because Ian wants him to do that, because Ian is controlling it, even though he's just a little boy. So, all right, this is the start of my first story, the scary one. This book tour began in Portland, Oregon, probably two months ago, and then there was a long gap. And I went out there to teach uh, a master class in novel writing. And while I was there, it was the second day of the class, I was uh, gathered with my students, and a guy walked in. And he was dressed to kill. He was beautifully dressed. He had a nice suit and a fedora on. And I recognized this guy, but I didn't know why. It was like seeing your priest at the swimming pool. You know, you, I was seeing him in an entirely different context and outfit from what I was used to seeing him as. And I didn't even know quite where I knew him from, but he hugged me and kissed me, and clearly he knew me better than I knew him. And he said, it's Michael. Didn't narrow it down. And so I, I said, I'm sorry, and I thought, and I thought. And it emerged that three years before, when I had been teaching another master class in Boise, Idaho, I had gone to the airport to take Alaska Airlines to take a flight home uh, back to Boston, and, and literally the wheels came off my suitcase. It had fallen apart, and he helped me sort that out. And he said I, he had read a number of my books, and because I was grateful to him for his help, I sent him a few more. And apparently he believed that we were friends. He believed we were even more than that. Well, my intern, Stephanie, and I, um, I, said to, I said, I'm sure he's a nice fellow. Don't worry about it. She said, he's not a nice fellow. He's really creepy. And I was not disposed to think of him that way. But we went back to the hotel, and the clerk said, uh, did you see your best friend? He checked into the room next to yours. I said, oh, my goodness. And naturally, I was thinking about that, uh, the young woman who was a news reporter. And, and I thought, well, if he drills a hole in the wall and looks through it, serves him right, you know, <laughs> I mean, for what he sees. And, um, and, but that wasn't really what scared me. I was afraid of what might happen next. Stephanie and I went out to dinner. No one knew where, but he showed up at the restaurant. And he sat down at our table, and he said, just go ahead and finish your dinner. Of course, I was never going to eat again because I was terrified. And we packed up our things and left, and he took a cab after our cab back to the hotel. And by then it was late at night. And I was really feeling nervous about this. And, you know, I, I grew up in Chicago. It takes a lot to scare me. But there was something really creepy about this. So I called a buddy of mine whose name is Gavin DeBecker. And I know Gavin really well because I stalked him. He wrote a book called The Gift of Fear. And it's a book about trusting your instincts in threatening situations. Gavin is the most, um, is the most, I guess you could say, successful um, security uh, uh, company owner in the United States, maybe the whole world. The movie The Bodyguard was based on Gav's life even though Gavin didn't look like Kevin Costner did then, and he still doesn't. And neither does Kevin Costner, to tell the truth. But, um, and uh, he employs at least 1,000 security agents, and they guard people on the Supreme Court and movie stars and, uh, and senators and, and people in a very quiet and successful way. And uh, I used to talk about this book all the time. If you haven't read it, you really should because it 
ratifies through stories the fact that all of our instincts are always right 100% of the time. Not 90, not 95, but 100% of the time. If you are creeped out by somebody, you have a reason to be, whether or not that person ever does anything. So uh, Gavin started to write to me. He said, I hear you've been going around talking about my book and, um, and saying how great it is, and I really appreciate that. You know, um, if you're ever in Fiji, come and visit me. He lived in Fiji at that time. And I said, okay, I will. In fact, I'll come in May. I did. I went in May, and I stayed for three weeks. Um, it was a long way, and I took two of my kids, and, you know, he didn't mind. He had a bunch of houses there, and we had a ball, and we got to be really good friends. He doesn't live there anymore, but he lives in a place that's far enough away that when I called him, it was the middle of the night. But he picked up because he has a different ring for everybody. And I said, I'm scared, Gavin. And he said, what's going on? And I told him. And he said, well, you need to do this right now. Even though it's midnight, you need to go next door to that room, knock on the door, and give him an unequivocal rejection. And two, one of two things will happen. Either he will, uh, either he will desist or it will escalate. And I said, well, you're not here. And when he escalates and sets me on fire, are you just going to read about that in the paper? And he said, no, he's not going to do that. He'll do it in a planful way because he's a planful kind of a guy. You know, he set up coming from another state to see you at this place, and he figured out where you were teaching. He's a planner. I said, okay. And I screwed myself up to my full five feet three inches, and I knocked on the door, and I said, I can have no relationship with you. We can't be friends. I can't stop you from reading my books, um, but I feel frightened by you. I don't ever want to see you again. And he closed the door, and Stephanie and I went back to our room, and we went on to the next state the next day, and he was there too. And so I called Gavin back, and he said, well... He didn't do anything illegal. It's not illegal to follow you. It's not illegal to sit at your table. But I'm going to have someone talk to him. And I thought, oh, this is rich. And then I looked out the window and uh, later, and there was a guy who looked like all the Marines in America all smushed together into one guy who was about 6'12 and about 600 pounds of all muscle leading this guy into the parking lot. I never saw him again. So, um, so through the stories that I had written, he believed, as so many of us do when we read stories, that those stories are being written for us, that they're speaking to a certain part of our lives, that they're speaking to a certain part of our condition, that, um, that, they, that the writer knows something about us in a very personal way. And certainly this guy, though, he got twisted about it. He did feel that way as well. Um, the, uh, the second story I want to tell you is a funny story. It has to do with people's underwear. Um, and this, I'm not the first writer that this ever happened to. And I'm not the second writer that this ever happened to, whom I know. I'm the third. Uh, one of them is my great friend, Chris Bojalian, uh, who's a wonderful novel writer, and this happened to him also. You know, you stay in a hotel, and you, uh, you know, you can wash your things, you, all your clothes, a certain amount of times, but after a while, you're just going to run out of underwear. And I met uh, one of the uh, at a hotel that I was staying in not long after this incident, I met one of the, the people who works there, and I gave her one of my books, I, actually this book, and she read it all night long, and she said, I will put a rush on your underwear because I love this book so much. And I said, oh, thank you. You couldn't have done anything kinder for me. And so I gave the underwear in, got it back, a little brown paper package the same day, put it in my suitcase. I got to the next town. I opened it up. And it wasn't my underwear. It was underwear, <laughs> but it wasn't my underwear. It wasn't even girl underwear. It was sort of like old whitey tidies who had that had seen better days, 
And I called the hotel and I said, this isn't, you are really nice to me. And I'm sorry to complain, but this isn't my underwear. And she just sort of covered the phone up. And she said, Ms. Machard, it is your underwear. You were the only person that day who turned. I said, no, it, it's really not. She said, we're not judging you for what kind of underwear wear you wear. And I said, listen, you know, if I was going to go over and wear that kind of underpants, at least I'd get some nice ones. These are all raggedy, and they're like size 42. They're not my underwear. And there was a silence, and then she said, well, they are. And I said, okay, well, I'm sending them back. I don't want these lousy underwear, and thanks for nothing. And I, I didn't know it wasn't that rude. But I did send them back. And a couple days later, I talked to my husband. My husband called me, and, you know, we don't have the kind of relationship where we talk on the phone every night and say, oh, I miss you so much, because he's busy, and I'm out here working. But he called me, and I thought, there's got to be something wrong with one of the children. And he said, Jack... I just got a package in the mail, and it's all ripped up, and there's underwear falling out of it. And I, I don't know if it's even yours, but it came from like Springfield, Illinois, and I don't think you were even in Springfield, Illinois. But I'm not asking you questions about what you were doing there and why your underwear is being returned in a package, because I feel that that's your business. But, um, but I just want you to know that your underwear is back. And, um, and because it's practically fallen out of the package, then I'm going to fix it. And there was a note inside there when, he, when Chris opened it up and it said, I really did like the book and I'm so sorry. And it wasn't signed. So, okay. And this is the third story. This is the sad story and it's even shorter. The first time I signed this book, was in, uh, the first time that I had a formal signing was in Madison, Wisconsin, which was my hometown for many years. And, yeah, yeah, oh, what a great place, huh? And, um, and a woman came up to me, beautifully dressed, lovely woman, maybe five, ten years younger than I. And I said, do you want me to personalize this? And she said, no, just sign your name. I'm going to give it to someone else, I'm not sure who. Um, I'm dying. And my breath stopped. I, I just sort of looked at her, and I knew she was on the level. And she said, yeah, I'm I, I probably have three or four months to live, maybe. Um, and three or four months is not a long time to live. It's not a long life. But it's, time, it's a lot of time to read a bunch of stories. And... Those are the only thing that comfort me now. They're the only thing that I can lose myself in. I lose myself in stories and I forget about the reality of my life and that it's not going to be long. And I don't think anything ever was more moving to me as a writer. And then I thought about the fact that that is in some way, not perhaps in that harrowing way, but in some ways that's true for all of us. That when we lose ourselves in stories, we're able to recuse ourselves from what's sometimes a world that doesn't make any sense to us in other ways. Because in stories, there is always a resolution. And we don't have to wait forever to find out what it is. And, not everything, and things may not turn out happily, but they turn out at least in a way that in some way makes sense and is satisfying. And I think of all the dark times that in my own life I turned to stories uh, and, and they always took me in. Stories never betray you. They, whenever you have to go there, just like the Bard of New England says, says about home being the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Stories are the same way. That when you, have to, when you turn to them, at dark times or in happy times, they always surround you and they always take you in. And they remain that part of our lives and that part of our culture that in times of mayhem, like election years, <laughs> make the most sense to us and, and remind us that there's a continuity 
through time. And it's a continuity of a narrative. And it's not just the narrative of a single person or a single story, but of all of us continuing. And that's all I have to say. But if you have any questions, like what kind of mascara does Oprah Winfrey really wear, I will answer those questions because I know that answer. Um, otherwise, um, otherwise we can, you can buy books and I'll sign them and, and, or you can just leave and we can part. Anyway, hi. Hi. Question that's got right. nothing to do with. Oprah oh, Winfrey's mascara. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But <laughs> my daughter has grown up in Florida. She's been accepted to University of Wisconsin in Madison. Lucky girl. And did you, is that, do you think that would be? That'd be the best thing that could happen to <laughs> that girl. Did you yes. go it there? Is a it is a kind, it is a, I did not go there. I went to the University of Illinois in Champaign. You've seen Risky Business, right? Where he puts on the sunglasses and says, looks like University of Illinois. I, uh, that's where I went. But Madison is a really big school, but it's in a small town. And it is a series of neighborhoods and uh, a very nurturing environment. She's been accepted to FSU, which has some very good football teams. I know <laughs> that. My son went there. Oh, yeah. Okay, now between the two. Well, you I'll know, let it go. I'll let it go. I don't know. I don't know. Madison is one of those places where if you go there as when you're young, um, it's hard to ever forget because it's 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 hard to ever forget because it you know I live in Massachusetts now and I think that Massachusetts is one of the most just and fair places on the whole earth but they call Madison 26 square miles surrounded by reality for a reason because there there's a story that's been going on there for a long time and it's a story about um, about creativity and justice and mercy that, um, that is ongoing. I, except for the giant, hairy, feel-bred mosquitoes and the temperatures so cold that your porch would fall right off your house, um, I miss it every day. There are no better people anywhere. I'm sure there are better people other places, but in general, it's a very uh, forgiving place to live and go to school. Who else? Does anyone else have anything to say? No? No? OK. Well, wait. Oh, you do. All right. So I'm interested in your creative process, okay. like what that looks like for you. Um, I'm sort of in the middle of that. I just read um, Liz Gilbert's book, Big Magic. Oh, uh, great book. So I'm just kind of listening to a lot of people's ideas around the creative process and I wonder what your thoughts are on that. How do you kind of come up with ideas for your stories? Well, like she said in that book when she was talking about Anne and uh, the idea for State of Wonder, that um, I don't know if they really come, if they're really like in the air and you sort of inhale them. I'm not, I'm not sure that that's true for me because I'm not I'm not uh, a very sort of spiritual person. I, I'm um, a pretty practical person who, um, who I, the way that I make connections through stories, uh, to stories, is if I see something that I can't forget. And for the two of by C, it's usually, it's usually some kind of image. For two of by C, it was, a picture of a Christmas tree that during the time um, of the many events that followed Hurricane Katrina, this Christmas tree was underwater. It was probably three feet underwater, but the lights were still on. Now that can't happen, right? That's impossible, except that it was, that image was real. And I started to think about this child, Ian, in this book as being akin to that Christmas tree, that he, it was impossible that he could exist and impossible that he could continue to shine in that way, but yet he did. And, and so when I thought about that child, I thought he can't exist in a vacuum. Someone has to look after him. And it could be a mom 
but that's expected. And then I thought, what if it was a guy who never wanted to be a dad? And what if he was put into that situation? What kinds of challenges would that offer me creatively if I put a guy in that situation of being mother and father to a little boy who he didn't know and who wasn't his own? And then, um, and then the story started to percolate. So it, but I was writing another book then at that time. And usually it takes about, is that my cell phone the whole time? I'm horrified. <laughs> I apologize. At least it's not ringing. If it was ringing, we'd all have been blown out the door because my cell phone ringtone is fanfare for the common man. Um, I'm really sorry. And I hope that that is important but not dire. In any case, uh, I, it, it's like making soup. You know, you start with the broth, and you put in some carrots, and you put in some leeks, and it's not quite right, and you put in salt and pepper and tomatoes, and you let it cook some more, and then cook some more. And it usually takes me about a year and a half of thinking about that idea and circling around it before I ever start to write. And then when I start to write, it's at the beginning, and I write all the way to the end. Uh, stopping to revise that story uh, so that each piece of it is perfect as I go along. So that when my agent receives it, he'll say, Jackie, this isn't just the best book you've written. It's the best book anyone has ever written. Except I only get to think that for about a week until the, he actually finishes reading it. And then he says, why is there a priest in this? Why did you spend so much time on that? What about the store? Why did that guy have a relationship with that woman instead of the other woman? And chapter 23, totally boring. Take the whole thing out. And then I, you know, and then again, I have to revise the whole book and write it for maybe the third time. And then the agent sells it. And the editor sees it and says, a girl that devout would have a strong relationship with her parish priest. Why isn't there a priest in this book? <laughs> and I'm not making that up. So then I write it again. So it's a long process. And, um, and it doesn't, when my friends say, I have all these friends who are writers, and they say, I'm just taking dictation from the universe. You know, the universe is giving me these ideas, and I'm just taking dictation. I'm writing them down. And I go to my room every night and say, universe, me, I'll take dictation. But that doesn't happen. I'm the boss of these people. I make them up, and I, you know, I make up what they do. You're welcome. So, y'all ready to go home? Oh, all right. I do, but I don't write novels every day. I'm a book editor, and I'm also an MFA teacher. That means Masters of Fine Arts in Creative Writing teacher. So I, I, sometimes I work on my student things. Sometimes I work on the books that I am the editor of for Merit Press, which is a realistic young adult publisher under the auspices of a big media company. But when I work on my books on my stories, then I have to have a certain length of time. I have to have at least four or five hours uh, to come up to speed and actually write, this, uh, write a story, start to write a story, because um, a couple, a, a half hour here and there isn't going to work for me. And usually I have to go away from home away from my family so that I can work on something for 10 or 12 hours in a day. Um, it, uh, and that includes messing around and rearranging everything on the desk um, and then finally doing it. I don't procrastinate, but you know, the house of fiction is, is a real house. It's invisible but it has to have plumbing and it has to have groceries in the refrigerator and it has to have all the things that the real, uh, the real world has. And to move into it takes time, just like it takes time to move into a real house. You know, you have to be emotionally engaged with it on the purest level in order to be able to do that. At least I do. 
I mean, I'm a little uncomfortable. It's not really my business. You mentioned your family. Um, there's uh, nine children, and there's a large, um, I mean, I have a 37-year-old and a 20, oldest and a 22-year-old. Right. And I thought that was a large uh, span. But yeah, well, my youngest kid is 10. My oldest kid is 31. And five kids still live at home, including the revenant in the basement, who doesn't know that we know he is there, you know, who is, a return, who is with it, doing a return engagement to childhood um, until he sorts out his life. And so, um, but we try to pretend that we don't know that Rob's coming up at night and saying, get some food out of the refrigerator, go back downstairs into the basement. Um, so, yeah, so I, but I contrived to have it this way when our family got out of control, when we had way too many kids for it to be sensible or normal or, or any of those kinds of things or to provide for them adequately except for um, the basics, you know, books. A, food, B, and, and clothing after a fashion. Um, it, to, um, it, it, when that became clear, I decided that w I needed to, you know, I'm old to have a 10-year-old. I'm never going to see the fair side of 50 or of even 55 again. But with that said, I decided that I wanted to be buggy by the time the last time, the last one left for good. And I think I am going to realize that, the way things are going. I think that by the time the youngest one is, is gone for good, I won't even know the difference. So. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yeah. Are you a grandmother yet? I am not <laughs> a grandmother yet that any of us knows of. Uh, no, my eldest is an irascible guy, and I'm sure that he would like to marry, but, you know, he's got to be in a good mood for more than 30 minutes at a time in order to realize that. Um, and so, no, no, short answer, no. And I, since I have a 10-year-old, I am not crowding that uh, real close. I'm not saying, oh, I can't wait. You know, I'm, I can wait. I can wait. Anyway, thank you so much. All right, folks. So if there are no more questions, then a reminder to our Internet audience watching at home, there is still plenty of time for you to call the number on your screen, and we can send a copy of the book to wherever you are in the U.S. free of charge. For those of you here in the house, we have Two of By Sea, as well as many of Jacqueline's previous titles for sale at the counter in the front room over there. She's going to be signing here at the table to the left of the podium. And that was such a charming talk. Please give another hand to Jacqueline Mitchard. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jacqueline.